Welcome to Muslims and Mental Health with Sister Heather, a groundbreaking program looking at mental health issues through the biopsychosocial spiritual paradigm. Welcome to another episode of Muslims and Mental Health. Today we're going to be discussing AIDS, HIV, and World AIDS Awareness Day. I'm going to be joined in a little bit by Khadija Abdullah from the Rahma organization. And um, I, but first I want to give you a few facts about HIV and AIDS um, and the World AIDS Day. World AIDS Day is held on December 1st each year and is an opportunity for people worldwide to in, unite in the fight against HIV and to show their support for people living with HIV and to commemorate people who have passed from HIV. World AIDS Day was the first ever Global Health Day and the first one was held in 1988. So this has been a tradition for a, a period of time. Around 100,000 are currently living with HIV in the UK and globally it's estimated 34 million people have HIV. More than 35 million people have died from the virus, making it one of the most destructive pandemics in history. Today, many scientific advances have been made in HIV treatment. There are laws to protect people living with HIV, and we understand much more about the condition than we did back in 1988. Um, but despite this, people still don't know the facts about HIV, and they don't know how to protect themselves oftentimes and um, they don't understand what it's like to live with HIV or the stigma and discrimination surrounding it. And World AIDS Day is an important day because it reminds people and the government um, that HIV has not gone away and that there's still a vital need to raise money, to increase awareness, to fight prejudice and improve education and reduce stigma toward HIV. So I'm going to be joined today by Sister Khadija Abdullah, who is um, on the board of directors of the uh, Rahma Foundation. And since 2012, Rahma has led efforts to break the silence that has stigmatized HIV, uh, plus um, to the Muslims and other affected groups that face uh, the, their HIV status. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Sister Khadija. Sister Khadija is um, has experience with HIV AIDS. She's an activist that began in college when she learned of a friend who had contracted the virus. Aware of her own ignorance, she started advocating on her college campus and organized the first AIDS Awareness Week. Due to her efforts, she received prestigious awards from the University and the State of Connecticut. She continued on to volunteer at AIDS Project New Haven and organized a team to walk in the AIDS Walk New Haven. After graduating in 2009, Khadija relocated to Washington, D.C. and completed an internship at the National Minority AIDS Council and began volunteering in the community. In 2010, she received the, uh, the President Obama Award for volunteerism for her efforts, and she later began work with Islamic Relief, a humanitarian nonprofit. And there she realized her passion was not sitting behind a desk, but directly uh, in the community of serving others. In 2012, she joined AmeriCorps and served at Horton's Kids in Washington, D.C., where she created partnerships with local organizations to provide HIV testing and educational workshops to inner-city youth and their families. Khadija holds a degree in public health with a concentration in health promotion. She is also certified as an HIV-AIDS community health worker, HIV tester, and counselor. Thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome and assalamu alaikum. Thank you for inviting me. So I want to get started today, um, if you will indulge us, to explain to us what Rahma is. I mean, besides that it means mercy. <laughs> <laughs> or I was going to say it means mercy. <laughs> um, so I started Rahma in 2012 when I, based on my um, background with my friend that was positive, I also met a Muslim that was living with AIDS, and I realized from him that he, you know, couldn't find any services or have support from his Muslim community. And it really bothered me. So I wanted to start an organization where we would go out and provide educational awareness to dispel myths and stereotypes and try to break the stigma. Because um, I'm another brother who was um, in a masjid in Ramadan, and uh, they found out he was HIV positive, and he's a volunteer serving iftar. And they were afraid to take food from him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... These little things like this, you know, it really, it really concerns me that we don't have support in our own community. So Rahma, which means mercy, 
our goal is to use mercy as our guide to, when we go out and do this work. So Rafa was started in 2012 in D.C., where HIV infections are the highest in the nation. And um, we really just trying to make a difference. So far, we definitely have you know, done workshops and worked with youth and had a support group. And we're starting a new um, board for those who are positive to help us, you know, figure out the right programs for them and how we can best address their needs. Um, we had interfaith programs. We're trying to do a retreat next year for positive um, Muslims. So there's a lot going on. And alhamdulillah, we've been successful. We're still a new organization. So we have the, you know, the um, barriers that can happen with new organizations. But alhamdulillah, inshallah, we'll keep going. So... You bring up a good point there, and how receptive is the Muslim community to the idea of understanding HIV and accepting that there are HIV-positive uh, Muslims? So it's actually a positive response, more so than I thought. Um, people seem to say, this is really needed, we're just happy you're doing this. People are coming out to volunteer. We've been invited to places around the U.S. to speak at different conventions and um, different conferences. Um, people that are positive are, um, you know, contacting us too, asking for, you know, support or, you know, just happy that we're here. And we have Muslims that are positive, active in our organization. So um, we really, you know, so far I'm like, we have some negative responses, of course, as well, but more so positive than negative. Mm-hmm. And so do you ever get people actually questioning that Muslims could actually have HIV? Yeah, so this one person said that we don't have HIV because, you know, we live a life where if we do anything right, we won't contract the virus. Um, <laughs> I was just like blown away by that because people, sometimes you contract through birth, through breast milk, by being sexually assaulted, through um, drug use. It's not just going out and fornicating. And if you are fornicating, that still need to be judged by your HIV status. So we are, everyone can get HIV. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if you're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, atheist, agnostic, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. So it really, you know, it really was sad to me that this person believed that, and he said somewhere in Africa, this whole village is pot is negative because they're Muslim. And I said, okay. I didn't want to get into an exchange with this person, but I was like, mm-hmm. it just really showed the need of why we need to continue doing this work. Mm-hmm. And so how are HIV and AIDS impacting the American Muslim community? Do we have statistics on that or do we, what do we know yet about that, you know, particularly part of the community? So we are um, trying to do research on that. We're actually going through an IRB board through a university in D.C. So we can do it the official way Mm -hmm. because we're Mm -hmm. involving human subjects. We can't just Mm -hmm. go out and ask people questions that aren't reviewed by a board to make sure they're okay to ask. Mm -hmm. So um, we're in the process of trying to get statistics, but we have people that come to us that are Muslim, and we say if one person has HIV, then it's enough reason for us to do this work. Mm-hmm. Okay, and what would you like to see happen uh, how, moving forward in the Muslim community around the issues of HIV and AIDS? Just to be more accepting. You know, don't turn your back if someone discloses to you that they're positive, because it, it can take a lot of courage to even say that. And then for you to like blow them off or be mean or you know, shut them out, it can make it even worse. And um, also, I think it's very important people get tested and know their status before they get married. And it'd be really great to see that matches require HIV testing before marriage. There are plenty of stories of people getting married and not knowing their status. And, you know, the spouse that's not positive becoming positive, not just HIV, other STDs as well. So I think it's very important that imams and leaders in the masjid do premarital counseling before marriage and also highly, strongly encourage um, testing before marriage. I totally agree with you. And I think um, certainly here in Southern California, there's some efforts underway to do that. uh, Because, I mean, there should be no stigma around getting this test. And if, if people have nothing to hide or, you know, then... They, they shouldn't be afraid to take it, even if they've never had sex before. You know, mm-hmm. they should still, it, it should be a, a no-brainer. Okay, let's just make sure and take it. And so everybody knows going into the marriage what, what is the case, right? And so. we're trying to launch a new program called Project Imam, where we sit down with the imams and actually go over 
HIV AIDS basics, how you can be supportive when someone comes to you from your congregation seeking support, spiritual advice, spiritual support. We're trying to do these different trainings so if it does happen, we can say this is a safe space at this match. This imam is very well aware and educated on HIV and other STIs or STDs. Mm-hmm. And you can go to them without feeling like, uh, is he going to judge me? You know, am I safe? So those are the things we're trying to work on as well. That's fantastic. Um, is that going to be across the nation or just in the East Coast? Or what is your plan so, there? All of our programs start in the East Coast and then we build up. Um, if we're invited and, you know, if our traveling costs are covered, we definitely come out somewhere else. But since we're in a nonprofit, we don't have a lot of funding. Mm-hmm. So it'd be hard for us to travel across the country. Like we were in California, but we were, our costs were covered and we came out there in 2013. Um, and we spoke at a, the Impact um, Convention. Mm-hmm. And then we had people go to, um, to um, Michigan and Chicago. So, I mean, it depends on where it is, our location. Okay. And how does uh, Rahma impact this issue? And what are, so you did, talked about some of the activities that you have, but are there other activities and events that you're doing as well? Other initiatives? So, just to go more in depth, um, we know, well, youth ages 13 to 24 are one of the severely impacted populations in the U.S. HIV, about one in five youth are positive out of all the total HIV infections um, each year. So we work with youth a lot. Mm -hmm. We started a program this year for Muslim and Christian youth. And the goal is to try to create a video that will be appropriate to show in masjids and in churches. Because we know how taboo it can be to talk about sexual health in these kind of settings. And we're working with local imams and local pastors so to get their input as well so we can make sure that they will actually show it in these places of worship. So, so far for the past year, we had about 25, 30 youth working on this project, Muslim Christian Youth, together. And we meet like once a month and we just plan. And hopefully next year, actually do the actual video. Mm-hmm. Um, also, we have an education program. We um, have sessions for youth, Muslim and non-Muslim, on sexual health. And it's like about four weeks long, two-hour sessions, and we go over sexual health reductive health, um, healthy relationships, self-esteem, um, even marriage for those, you know, who are going, seeking to get married. And we cover that. Um, we also do street outreach. Mm-hmm. So we go in the community and we talk to youth on the street and provide statistics and information and resources to them as well. Um, we have done workshops where we went to masjids and the basic HIV workshops in the masjids and have partners where we provided free HIV testing to attendees. Um, we've did events in recognition of National HIV Testing Day, which is in June, um, World AIDS Day, December 1st. We've done National Youth HIV AIDS Day events, which is in April, um, Black AIDS Day, which is in February. Actually, this past February, I was at a church and I was on a panel and I spoke about HIV and AIDS, um, and, you know, the work that we do in a church, in a church full of people, different, um, with just backgrounds. Um, and again, we're trying to retreat this, the next, uh, next year. For Muslims who are positive, they come to a secluded place and just find spiritual support, mental health um, support, wellness um, support, um, help from an imam, and then we haul out food and just get away and meet other people who are positive. So inshallah, if people are interested, they can stay tuned and we'll have more information on that on our site as well. But we're just trying to, basically just trying to address the stigma and trying to really be a support system. Um, we launched a buddy system program where someone who's not positive for over like five years can be a buddy for someone who's newly diagnosed. Mm-hmm. So we can partner them together and they can be a support buddy for that person. We did a support group at one point, but it's kind of inactive right now. But um, it was national, actually. People can call in from like nationally or actually go in person to our office. Our office is in D.C. So, I mean, so we had that space and then we did like a a phone conference call in. So those are our programs right now. Um, inshallah, we hope we can do more in the future, but this is what we are able to do at this point. So I want to circle back for a second to the buddy program that you have and sure. ask you um, <clears throat> for so that people can become more empathic and sensitive. What are some of the things that a person goes through when they first find out that they're HIV positive? Well, from what I've been told by those who are positive, it's just 
Some of them have a fear. They don't know who they can turn to or where they can go to, you know, seek health care, especially in the mass. They don't know who they can talk to about it. And a lot, a lot of people I've spoken to are very, unfortunately, depressed. Um, and, you know, they're trying to figure out how they can navigate life now with this new diagnosis. So that's why we have this buddy system of people who, you know, have been experiencing living with HIV for a period of time. And they're able to, you know, provide resources and provide support and comfort um, to the, the new um, diagnosed so they can understand that life still goes on. You still have a healthy life. You can still do a lot of the same things you're doing before and not think that HIV defines you now because it doesn't. Mm-hmm. So we're just trying to definitely provide that extra support for newly people who are diagnosed with HIV. And they can definitely contact us if they're looking for a buddy system or a buddy. Um, they can email me. Uh, go to our site, and we have a contact form as well. So there are different ways to get in touch with us. I think that's fantastic because it lets people know they're not alone, which is really yeah. important. Um, mm-hmm. So I want to continue and ask you some more questions, but I need to take a break sure. for our sponsor, <laughs> and we will be right back. Welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24 hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1 888 242 4450. A lot of time we don't even know what's wrong with us and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Welcome back to Muslims and Mental Health. Today we're discussing HIV, AIDS, World AIDS Day, and the Rahma organization with Sister Khadija Abdullah. We're gonna continue. I wanna ask you some more questions about this issue. And um, we left off talking about some of the uh, programs and activities that Rahma uh, offers, but I wanna transition now and ask you a little bit about what, how you see parental involvement in this issue. Um, how do you see parents discussing this with their children uh, in the Muslim community between Muslims? Uh, and within the, the context of the larger uh, community, um, I know that you mentioned earlier that you have partnered with uh, the broader community, interfaith community. So just, you know, want to see how you feel that people should be communicating about this issue. I think it's very important that parents are involved in sexual health education. Like a lot of moments that I know don't even know much about sex. Mm-hmm. And I think the parents should teach their children first before the school teaches them or the media or a friend. So um, we're actually trying to do a program where we're trying to involve parent youth communication and how we can open up those channels where it's not like, you know, awkward conversation. And we're talking to one of our partners about this as well. They have resources where they actually do this kind of training. So we're going to work together and try to create a program where we, we identify different, you know, community, in the community, talk to parents, I work just for them. We sit down with them and talk about HIV and AIDS and try to make it clear and easy and basic for them to understand and how it's important to talk to their kids about it. We have some Muslim youth in our area that are living with HIV and other STIs. And unfortunately, the parents are so afraid they won't, they are preventing them getting help and seeking medical attention. Yeah. And we're trying yeah. to break those barriers because it's very important to seek <laughs> medical attention, uh-huh. but also to have support from your own family. Um, so these are one of our many goals is try to educate parents because they are the forefront in their child's care because they're at home with them. They, you know, they live with their child. Their child looks to them for help and advice a lot of the times. So they really need to be um, educated. But also at the same time, we do some programs that are just for youth so they can feel more relaxed in the environment with their peers. So, Yeah, I mean, that's really important because like with other um, medical issues, 
earlier detection allows for better um, treatment, right? So mm -hmm. the more the parents can get on board, then and the earlier they can get on board, the better outcome hopefully for for the um, the child or the youth. And the reality is, sex is part of life, and we're going to come across it in our, our life, whether we're in a store, or seeing magazines, or watching a TV show, or our friends talk about it. So don't let, you can't like, act like it's not there, because it is. Mm -hmm. So as a parent, I feel is their place to talk to their kids about it, and help them understand right choices, choices they maybe they shouldn't do, you know, and how they can support them when they need to come talk to them about their own concerns. Right, because if they don't talk about it, somebody's going to be talking about it to so. them. And so it's better if, if they are talking to their children so that they can ensure that the values that they have are the ones that are being given instead of it being replaced with who knows what, you know, whatever's out there. Um, so I think that's that's great. Um, and also, if they have a child that is living with STD, still be supportive and loving to them, still right. be a, a, a you know, support for them because they need it. You know, they don't want their, to feel like they're not welcome in their own home, mm -hmm. you know. So I think it's important as well. Mm -hmm. And so what can be done now to make a, co a positive contribution to this issue? I think the main thing is educate, educating yourself, knowing the actual facts, knowing that HIV is not a death sentence anymore. People are living very long lives. Medication is available. It's considered a chronic disease now, like diabetes or like um, high blood pressure. You take medication for it. You make sure you take care of it, and you can live a longer life. I mean, of course, there are, there are side effects of medication as well. It's not like an easy, like, oh, I'm taking medication. I'm, I'm great. You might have side effects from medication. But just know that you most likely will not. It's not like the 80s where like you people will die left and right. Mm -hmm. People are living, look healthy, you can't even tell if someone has HIV. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important to educate ourselves and know these facts and then know how we can be supportive to someone who might disclose to us that they're positive or might need help. And if you want, you can invite us <laughs> to your area. We can do a workshop and talk to local partners and have testing, and you can contact us, ask any questions you may have, and inshallah we can be of service. Mm -hmm. Which would certainly contribute to progressing in this area of communication uh, with the community at large if they were to invite you to come to the community and talk about it, um, mm -hmm. and so they can learn about it. Um, is there anything else you would like our audience to know, and also how can people reach Rahma? So we have a website, it's www.haverahma.org, so haverahma.org. And you can also email me at Khadija, K-H-A-D-I-J-A-H, at haverahma.org. Um, we have a phone number, we have an address, my personal phone number, you can call me, I'm open to that. It's 203-508-3999. We're open to communication channels. We respond fairly quickly. We have a newsletter. You can join our, our newsletter list and know what we're doing in the community. We are, the next event is on World AIDS Day. We're doing a little a flash mob in the D.C. area. And we're going to have free HIV testing. We're working with our partners. But I think the way you definitely can help is just, again, education and just knowing that HIV you, is just not like a contagious disease that you can get by being around someone who's positive because that's not true pretty much. And so, <laughs> so Khadija, um, you, so you're um, a dot org, which means you're a 501c3 status, yes. right? Yes. And so do you accept donations on your website? How yes. can people contribute financially if they want to, to your organization? You visit our site, Click the Take Action button, and we'll have options for donations. We're a nonprofit set is recognized by the IRS. Everything is tax deductible. And since we are a new organization, we don't have a lot of funding. So if you donate to us, it would be a great help. Um, help us continue our programs and providing this much um, needed to our community. Great. I myself have enjoyed uh, being able to donate in the past and look forward to donating mm -hmm. in the future. I think it's a great organization to support. You guys do great work. And I'm so glad that we've been able to touch base with you today. I want to transition now. We ask all our interviewees some fun questions. 
And sure. so I'm going to continue with that. Um, who is your Muslim hero if you have one and why? I may sound silly, but Khadija. <laughs> <laughs> I always saw him. She was a very educated woman, a businesswoman, very smart, very intelligent. And I think of her as a hero. I look up to her. I read about her, I read about her in the books and just how strong she was. It really inspires me to, like, sometimes I'm very shy and I get nervous speaking in front of people. <laughs> but I do it because I have to do it sometimes. I think it's very important when I believe something to actually go out and talk about it. So I might talk really fast or might just be a little jittery. But I think about, okay, if I can help someone, I'm going to overcome this fear and do it. And with her, like, when she made a profit and they went through all those different hard times, she was still very strong and on to her faith. And that, you know, it just inspires me to keep going and think, do what I think is right to do. Great. And what is your favorite concept in Islam and why? Mercy. <laughs> Again. <laughs> it's <laughs> all relevant, Allah, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's really relevant. <laughs> because Allah, he's so merciful. Like, he's so forgiving. He's so compassionate and so kind. And, like, even if you make a mistake, if you mess up, he has all this mercy and he just showers us with this and he's, you know, he's there. He makes things easier for us. So I feel like if we as humans, if God has mercy, how can't we have mercy? You know, why can't we show compassion to people in our community that need it the most? So I think mercy, like mercy is something that I try to, that I want to live by. I think it's very important to be merciful to others. And because you, you never know if you need that mercy. I'm like, especially in the judgment, like it's, it's, it's going to be real. And we all going to need mercy. So I think it's important that we show it to others. Great. And what is your favorite word and why? Favorite word? Um, hmm, good question. My favorite word is actually two words. Go hard. <laughs> 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 and I say that because either you go hard or you go home. Like you, if you believe something, don't think, oh, I can't do this. You know, what if this happens? When people think something different of me. If you have those fears, you're never going to go far in life. You, if you believe in something, you either go hard or just don't do it at all. And I think you should do it. So for me, go hard. That's a great way to wrap up this episode. <laughs> what, how wonderful. Go hard. I like that. So <laughs> thank you so much, Khadija, for joining us today. Um, awesome. This has been very useful and helpful. And I hope that the community benefits and gets a lot out of this. Uh, inshallah, okay. people will be contacting you to have you come to their community or donating online to support the organization. So thank okay. you again for joining us. Uh, this concludes another episode of Muslims and Mental Health. We are always open to your comments, your feedback, your concerns, and you can reach us at nefshealertherapy at gmail.com. That's N-A-F-S-H-E-A-L-E-R therapy at gmail.com. And you can also find resources on our website at nefshealer. Uh, therapy.wordpress.com and we will have a link to the Rahma site uh, on the Nafs Healer uh, therapy.wordpress.com so please join us again for another episode of Muslims and Mental Health. Thank you.